In 2012, in what would become the largest Atlantic storm on record, swirled violently from the Caribbean, creating a devastating oceanic force. At one point, it exhibited the lowest barometric pressure ever recorded on the Atlantic seaboard. The name of the storm was Sandy. Within days, Sandy set its sights on the most populated area of the continent, Manhattan Island. The storm destroyed property, eroded shorelines, dumped 10 million gallons of sewage into the water, and killed 25 people. It took years, but eventually New York City recovered. In April of 2018, approximately six years after Superstorm Sandy's devastation, skeletal remains were reported to be scattered on the beach of Hart Island, which lies just off the coast of the Bronx. Some of the bones were even protruding from the shoreline. The remains discovered that day unearthed a secret kept hidden for more than 150 years. Lying beneath the ground of this nondescript tiny island were the remains of nearly one million people buried in wide, deep pits. The dead included stillborn babies, unclaimed paupers, Union and Confederate soldiers, the insane, the addicted, and the unidentified. After nearly a century and a half as the result of recent advances in DNA and fingerprint technology, we can now identify some of these anonymous lost souls and reveal the hidden history of Hart Island, America's largest mass graveyard. By the early 1800s, New York City boasted a population of more than 200,000, qualifying it as the largest city in the Western Hemisphere. As New York City's population grew, so did its number of dead. By 1822, the number of interred bodies in Trinity Church Cemetery was estimated to be over 120,000. But it was just that an estimate. New York City was facing an unprecedented crisis at an unprecedented speed. A solution needed to be found as to where to bury all of the dead. Beginning in 1840, Hart Island had become a favorite venue for, of all things, bare-knuckle boxing, as it had been outlawed in New York City proper. During that period, bouts would draw thousands of spectators. It was said that on day of important fights, the crime rate would be cut in half in Manhattan, as the rogues, misfits, and gang members usually could be found attending the bouts. In 1864, as the Civil War gained momentum, construction of barracks began at the southern tip of the island to hold approximately 5,000 prisoners of war. In 1868, the city of New York, under the auspices of the Department of Public Charities and Correction, purchased Hart Island from the John Hunter family for $75,000. The island was used as a training facility for new soldiers. Between 2,000 and 3,000 raw recruits were initially expected but more than 50,000 men ultimately trained on the island. Over the next hundred years, Hart Island would be used as a prison, a quarantine site for the waves of epidemics and pandemics that rolled across the city, a psychiatric hospital, a boys' reformatory, and in the 1950s, briefly as a Nike missile base to thwart Russian nuclear missiles. But 45 acres at the northern end were designated as a potter's field in 1869. The first burial would be soon. Her name was Louisa Van Slyke. 
1869, she would die of yellow fever, alone in New York City's Charity Hospital on Blackwell's Island. With no friends or relatives to claim her, she would become the first of almost a million people to be laid to rest in the potter's field on Hart Island. The photographer waited for just the right moment, the right looks on the face of the people he was keenly watching on the crowded tenement block. He was making history. Meanwhile, the masses looked on nonchalantly, more concerned with how they were going to eat that night or if they had enough money to keep the lights on. Their stomping ground, a stretch of block on East 26th Street between 1st Avenue and the East River, was aptly named Misery Lane. It was a place where no one wanted to end up. The area was filled with wobbly pushcarts, odorous beggars, homeless people, skinny stray dogs, and all the tumult of a largely immigrant community. Late 19th century New York City seemed more like a shabby bazaar than the sophisticated bastion of international culture it would later acquire. Jacob Riss was a Danish-born immigrant from a working-class family who moved to New York in 1870 when he was age 21. Jacob finally caught a break when he was hired as a low-level police reporter and assigned to the Lower East Side. It was here, using the newly invented flashbulb photographic camera, which commercially debuted in 1887, that Riss would begin his own independent investigation into the conditions of New York's poor tenement dwellers. He and three photographer friends started to photograph the slums. Riss's book, How the Other Half Lives, Studies Among the Tenements of New York, contain more than a hundred photographs, some remaining famous to this day. A gaunt inmate in a mud-splattered uniform stands bent over a rough patch of upturned dirt, one foot balanced precariously on the shifting soil at the lip of the trench, and a gloved hand extended to the man at the bottom. It is if he was saying, how many more? Beside him, two simple pine boxes rested side by side. Another half dozen lay neatly in the square, freshly dug grave under an overcast sky. A supervisor in a double-breasted suit, bow tie and top hat, clutches a cane and stands guard watching the team work. Riss sardonically remarked, in one of the chapters of his book, How the Other Half Lives. One free excursion awaits young and old, whom bitter poverty has denied, the poor privilege of the choice of the home in death they were denied in life, the ride up the sound to the potter's field, charitably styled the city cemetery. But even there they do not escape their fate, in the common trench of the poor burying ground, they lay packed three stories deep, shoulder to shoulder, crowded in death as they were in life, to save space. For even on that deserted island, the ground is not for the exclusive possession of those who cannot afford to pay for it. How exactly did bodies end up at Hart Island? Well, their first stop was Bellevue Hospital's morgue. By the 19th century, the Bellevue morgue had become the official repository of recently deceased New Yorkers. Bodies had been buried after a few days, but for identification and forensic purposes, clothing and other personal articles were kept on display for a month, then put into storage. Prior to transport and burial, cadavers in the Bellevue morgue were wrapped in shroud paper and sealed in pine coffins lined 
with waterproof paper. The morgue was thorough in processing the dead, as inside the coffins and on top of them are placed the duplicate and triplicate, respectively, of the burial certificate, chemically treated so they are legible even after 25 years. The coffins were placed in a Department of Hospitals morgue wagon, the first ambulance, as it were, which operated twice a week. They were delivered to the channel landing and the specific part of the pier operated by the New York City Department of Corrections on City Island in the Bronx. They were then unceremoniously loaded onto a small weather-beaten ferry and transported across a stretch of the Long Island Sound to Hart Island. Inmates from New York's Rikers Island Prison have served as grave diggers since the inception of the Potter's Field because it is owned and operated by the city's Department of Corrections. These coveted positions are said to only go to the best-behaved prisoners. Every 25 years, the approximate time allotted for complete human decomposition, the burial trenches are refilled with fresh bodies from the Bellevue morgue in new pine boxes, some large, some smaller, and many no bigger than a shoebox. The perennial ritual begins anew. Every night, patrons crammed into the bar's cozy booths, drinking all variety of cheap spirits and ever-flowing beer, often to the point of delirium. The place had character, and the crowd was tight. With a kind of -of end-of-the-world theme, patrons were on a first-name basis to counter the anonymity of the streets. If society offered no salvation for these folks, Sammy's offered a sense of purpose, a sheltered harbor in the storm of street life. Many of those who donned their one good coat and polished their one nice pair of shoes for their big night of intoxicated release and escape at places like Sammy's returned to their makeshift rooms in one of the neighborhood's municipal shelters, which afforded some protection from the elements and a few hot meals to people who otherwise would have starved in the cold. Many of these buildings still stand today, like the White House Hotel, a 92-year-old building just off Bond Street. The average room contained a small cubicle with just enough room for a simple bed, often a wooden shelf and a cheap foam mattress, a tiny wooden storage cabinet, some hooks on the wall, and a fluorescent light fixture. A traveler visited the building in 2009 and commented, The lobby had the feel of a sanitarium, minus the institutional obsession with cleanliness. Residents sat hunched over cans of soda or cups of coffee, eyes closed or staring, lost in silence. A man in a wheelchair whose left leg ends in a stump below the knee can often be found there, listening to music on earphones. After a time, he laboriously wheels himself across the lobby, through another door, and down the hall towards his room. In a picture taken in the 1930s, a group of Hart Island convicts is burying a series of bodies straight from the Bowery. The people had died from drinking wood alcohol, or smoke, as it was called in some out-of-the-way place. And how many were buried at Hart Island at this point? While they're not drinking smoke today, maybe it's cheap brandy from 7-Eleven or a can of steel reserve. Homelessness and substance abuse are still as present as they ever were in New York City. In the summer of 1795, New York was struck with an outbreak of yellow fever, one of the first in a long line of infectious diseases that would find their way to a city that quickly was becoming an international beacon for the impoverished and unwanted. The outbreak lasted until 1803 and killed thousands. 
Between the end of the first major outbreak of yellow fever and the following 50 years, New York housed multiple acute episodes of typhoid fever, typhus, and cholera. Cholera, transmitted by contaminated food and water, killed thousands of people in the summer of 1832 until doctors learned how to better identify early signs and take preventative measures to stop its spread. By the mid-18th century, smallpox reached most of the world. It was a leading cause of death in Europe in the mid-1800s, with an estimated 400,000 killed each year. In New York, the potential for contamination shot up exponentially, particularly in neighborhoods near seaports, where goods and foodstuffs were handled. As horsepower was the primary mode of transportation until the advent of the automobile, many medical officials of the age believed that horse manure, which could be smelled in every street corner in New York, could be the cause of certain outbreaks. Quarantine was an attempt to handle these diseases. Built over the course of two years and completed in 1856, Renwick's smallpox hospital was a tangible, practical solution to the episodic outbreaks. Located at the southern tip of Blackwell's Island, its looming Gothic revival spires and austere entrance evoked the somber, almost medieval mood of public health at the time. It remained the city's only designated quarantine and treatment center for smallpox for decades. In 1875, smallpox patients were transferred to nearby Brothers Island, just a short ferry ride away. In 1885, New York City purchased the island, closed the facility, and began to build a new hospital for the broader treatment of infectious diseases which were racking up at an alarming death toll. Patients with smallpox, measles, scarlet fever, polio, and most infamously typhoid fever were all housed on this isolated island. In 1918, the Spanish flu, as it was called, or the great influenza pandemic hit New York City. It is estimated that over 35,000 New Yorkers died. First reported in the United States in 1981, AIDS quickly spread in New York City in a matter of months. From 1980 to 2000, it is estimated that over 100,000 New Yorkers died of the disease, the single worst cause of death in New York's history. Tragically, Many of the gay men who succumbed to AIDS were ostracized by their families and when notified of their deaths, refused to claim their remains. And they, like the thousands of other victims of yellow fever, cholera, smallpox, influenza, and now a modern day scourge, COVID-19 victims would all suffer the same fate. Buried in fear and in haste, tens of thousands were interred for all eternity on Hart Island. Does the name Dawn Powell mean anything to you? I thought so, but you're not alone. Just as millions of people knew nothing about Hart Island, millions of people never heard of Dawn Powell, who, by the way, is also buried there. It's rather startling in a humorously dark way when one learns about the circumstances surrounding the demise of Dawn Powell and her burial befitting, well, befitting a pauper. At the time of her death from colon cancer in 1965, every single one of her books had gone out of print. A spooky foretelling, perhaps? Upon her death, as she requested, Her body was donated to the Cornell Medical Center for research. Within five years, her remains were to be returned to a designated family or friends for burial. At the time, the individual contacted for this sobering task was her publicist, 
who quickly refused custody of the remains and may even have said all too quickly something about erring the once prolific writer in the New York City Cemetery on Hart Island, post-haste. Shortly before she died, perhaps a premonition, Dawn Powell wrote the following. Satire is people as they are. Romanticism, people as they would like to be. Realism, people as they seem with their insides left out. Bobby Driscoll was handpicked for an acting career by Walt Disney himself. Of all the roles he played, Peter Pan seemed most like his alter ego. He grew up and worked in Hollywood, but it might as well have been Netherland. His is a story of success in a make-believe world, a world he could never leave behind. Hollywood would eventually be his downfall. In 1968, Driscoll's dead body was found by two boys who were exploring the ruins of an abandoned tenement in Greenwich Village. He was without money and identification. Like any unknown homeless person or drifter, his body was transported to the office of chief medical examiner. The cause of death was reported as hardening of the arteries, which is common in heroin users. His body was transported for burial to the city's official pauper's gravesite on Hart Island. Bobby was the very first actor Disney put under contract after the Second World War. His first Disney film, Song of the South, jump-started his film career. For the next five years, Driscoll was Disney's resident child star. He went on to appear in Treasure Island, and was the physical model and voice of Peter and a host of others in Disney's Peter Pan. In 1950, he was the recipient of the first Juvenile Academy Award for his performances. At one point in his career, Bobby was making $50,000 a year, yet he was only able to collect 25 cents a week. He couldn't touch the money he made and was not allowed to read fan mail. Said Bobby, I have found that memories are not very useful. I was carried on a silver platter and then dumped in a garbage can. In 1956, Bobby married Marilyn Jean Rush, and they had three children. He had several arrests at that time and drug charges, and in 1965, he received a prison term in California's Chino State Penitentiary. In 1972, his death was revealed to the public when Song of the South was re-released in movie theaters. Although his name appears on his father's gravestone, Bobby's remains still rest on Hart Island. Did you ever wonder what kinds of individuals are more apt to commit suicide? If they're movie stars, does it have something to do with too much fame, not enough fame, or something else? What did life, or the absence of it, mean to actress Sheila Terry, who was a true Hollywood starlet of the 1930s, before she ended her life by overdosing on sleeping pills? When did her ability or desire to go on cease her body on the bedroom floor, leaning against the bed, five medicine bottles with the contents removed, were on the floor beside her. Her film career spanned nearly a decade, and she appeared in over 40 films, including three that she starred with John Wayne. Yet, without family or friends to intervene, she died alone and penniless. So alone, that she was buried on Hart Island. New York reporter Mel Hymer wrote in his signature column, My New York, A couple of days ago, I picked up a newspaper and saw that Sheila Terry had taken too many of the little pink pills. 
and wouldn't awaken ever again. Chalk one up for the cold city. Leonard Melfi was one of the most prolific playwrights in New York's 1960s experimental theater scene. And he once said, I write about people meeting each other and reaching out to each other. I love that. Most theater professionals of the day would agree that Melfi was largely responsible for relighting the fire of interest and creativity in New York's off-Broadway and off-off-Broadway resurgence. Born and raised in Binghamton, New York, Melfi moved to New York City and turned to playwriting. He recalled, I found that it really turned me on watching what other actors do in the plays that I wrote. Melfi was revered by his peers as one of the most respected and creative playwrights of his generation. He was best known for his work with the offbeat La Mama Experimental Theater Club on East 4th Street in New York's East Village, which produced 22 of his plays. By October of 2001, Melfi had been struggling with alcoholism for some time and was renting a single room at the Narragansett Hotel at Broadway and 93rd Street in New York. His niece had tried several times to see him, but his door was locked and he didn't answer. She became concerned enough to call paramedics to the hotel. They entered Melfi's room and found him in cardiac distress. He was taken by ambulance to Mount Sinai Hospital, the closest medical facility to where he lived. He died of congested heart failure four hours later in the emergency room. It was eventually reported that his body was misplaced by hospital staff and ended up being buried on Hart Island in March of 2002. Enter the world of one of America's foremost jug band leaders, Lloyd Buford the Whistler Threlkeld. He was a pioneering jug band musician. He was born in 1893 and was known as the Whistler for his ability to make sweet, melodious sounds emerge from his practice nose flute. He also played guitar and sang. Whistler and his jug band was one of the most famous jug bands of its time. In 1932, he moved to New York City and lived right in the center of Harlem. He continued performing but stopped recording. In May of 1935, he was admitted to Bellevue Hospital with tuberculosis. He died in September of that year. Threlkeld was a known entity. He had a successful public career and following. His music had been recorded and performed by jug bands around the world. But he died without recognition and without company. He was buried, along with so many others, of similar status in the vapid earth of Hart Island. In 2013, Buford, the whistler Threlkeld, was posthumously inducted into the Jug Band Hall of Fame. The tiny pine boxes were neatly stacked, five deep and five across, in Hart Island sand and clay. The long mass grave, which ultimately would hold 1,000 such coffins, bore no names or monument. No funeral was held. No mourners could visit. The only memorial was a dog-eared, handwritten ledger of the latest arrivals. Baby girl, Saturn, three hours. Boy, Samuel, one day. Anonymous, two hours. This is what it was like when a reporter visited the potter's field at Hart Island to witness the burial en masse of children who were never given a chance of life. Of the island's one million buried people, it's estimated that one-third are children, like these, the victims of stillbirths, disease, or any number of untold contingencies that take the lives of infants of primarily disadvantaged backgrounds. Ranked 
at the 10th worst in terms of infant and child mortality among the 22 largest cities that were surveyed in the mid-1980s. New York City provided a seemingly endless supply of unfortunate children that fill Hart Island's common trench. This island does not see many visitors. Many New Yorkers know nothing about it. Perhaps it's easier that way. Hart Island is a mass graveyard. It is a place where the poor, the indigent, and the unknown are buried by the city. No funerals are held. No funerals are needed.